just that reminded me to hit record. So now we are recording tonight's event. And so if you RSVP'd on the Action Network event, we will be sending that out to you later along with some links and things that uh, materials that our speakers have shared. Um, and so if you are watching on Facebook and you didn't RSVP, you still can do that if you wanna receive that email. And you can do that at bit.ly slash June 10 forum on June, all, that's all caps. Um, so in a few minutes, a few moments, I will introduce our panel. Um, but first I wanted to just offer a few words of introduction to get us started. So, um, we are very aware that we are in a time of crisis, uh, but I think we also are seeing and feeling in this moment that we have been in crisis for a long time. And right now we're just witnessing and experiencing in a new way, the pre-existing crises that this pandemic has both ex exposed in a deeper way and exacerbated. And we've been seeing that our government has been both unwilling and unable to protect people from this virus. But not only that, it has too often been a willing collaborator in protecting the wealth and profits of corporations at the expense of people's lives. And that cost in people's lives has been extreme, especially here in New York State. 112,000 people in the United States have died so far. And here in New York, it's over 30,000 people. And nowhere has been hit harder than black and brown and poor communities, especially in New York City. And we know it's not an accident or a coincidence. It's the direct result of racist policies at every level of government. And overall, a government that has not been willing to protect the lives of its people over the profits of corporations and the, and the wealthy. And over the last several weeks, we've also been seeing another consequence come into view more clearly, and that is austerity. With federal help not seeming to be coming anytime soon, state and local budgets are facing huge deficits. We're already seeing cuts to public education and all kinds of other public services, and we're gonna hear a lot more about that later. And at the same time, here in New York, Governor Cuomo announced the creation of the Reimagine Education Advisory Council. He announced that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and uh, former Google CEO Eric Schultz would be part of planning New York State's reopening and education and health into the future. And so all of these things, these funding cuts, instruction being forced online, and the involvement of these billionaire quote unquote reformers pose huge risks to public education as we know it. And we have to understand these developments within the context of this decades long battle around public education and public goods in general. We know that public education was already under attack and the, this pandemic is a potential inflection point in that struggle. We know that those who have been working to defund and privatize schools for years are seeing this as a moment of opportunity. And it can be an opportunity too for defenders of public education. So on the one hand, there is this danger, but on the other, especially coming after this wave of teacher organizing and strikes that we've seen around the country over the last few years, perhaps it can be a catalyst for reinvestment and recommitment to public education too. And we wanted to have this conversation tonight because which way that goes has huge ramifications for all of us. It's not just an education issue or a labor issue, it's a moral issue. Because what is at stake is partly the idea of a public good in the first place. The idea that we're part of a society that has responsibilities to each other and that there should be public goods that we all invest in and enjoy and benefit from together. And so we're really excited to bring together folks representing the labor community, which is one of the strongest fronts of struggle for public goods and public education in particular. And so we're gonna hear from some 
folks representing all different kinds of workers in, uh, in public education, um, as well as hearing from the, the, about a little bit more about the moral part of the struggle. So I wanna introduce our panelists and then we will get started. So we're very honored first to have with us tonight, Frederick Kowal, who is the president of United University Professions, which is the nation's largest public higher education union representing more than 37,000 academic and professional faculty in the State University of New York system. Kowal previously served as UUP statewide membership development officer and as UUP chapter president at SUNY Cobalt School. And as a faculty member there since 1985, he taught political science and Native American studies. He is also a vice president for the American Federation of Teachers and a member of the National Wildlife Federation's board of directors. We also have with us tonight Donald Nesbitt, who is the executive vice president of DC 37, local 372. He started as a cafeteria worker in 1998 eventually becoming a cook in charge and a union shop store at Acorn High School for Social Justice in Brooklyn. He is also the chair of the DC 37 Political Action Committee, a member of the Labor Council for Latin American Adv Advancement, coalition, coalition of Black Trade Unionists, and is also an executive committee member of the New York chapter of the NAACP. We also have with us tonight um, the Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, who is co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, and the director of the Cairo Center for Religions, Rights, and Social Justice at Union Theological Seminary. She has spent over the past two decades organizing amongst the poor in the United States, and she is an ordained minister in the, uh, the Presbyterian Church USA, and also teaches at Union Theological Seminary in New York City. And she's also the parent of two children who are in the NYC public schools. Um, we also have with us and Andrea Vasquez, who is the first vice president of the Professional Staff Congress at CUNY. Um, she has worked for over a dozen years to organize higher education officers across CUNY and to uh, recently to reconstitute the Graduate Center PSC chapter. She is also the associate director of the American Social History Project and Center for Media and Learning and Managing Director of the Graduate Center's New Media Lab. And um, she is also working on the CUNY Digital History Archive Project. And uh, we have Laura Franz here as well, who is president of the Albany Public School Teachers Association. She is a product of the Albany schools and has spent her entire 26 year teaching career as a middle school ELA teacher and peer reviewer within the city school district. She has served in almost every role in her uh, local from building rep to president um, and is a new member on the NYSIT board of directors. And last but not least, Andrew Dobbin is the campus chair and business agent of the Stony Brook chapter of the Graduate Student Employees Union, which is CWA Local 1104. GSEU represents more than 5,000 teaching assistants and graduate assistants throughout the SUNY system. And he's also co-founder of the Suffolk County Democratic Socialists of America and their former co-chair. He's a PhD student in philosophy, writing a dissertation on ecology and mass politics. So we have a, a diverse panel with us representing all sectors of education. And the first question that I want to pose to all of them is twofold. So we, we know that um, we've seen attacks on public education over the past few decades. How, has, how have the issues that you are already fighting before COVID-19 been exacerbated by this crisis? And what do you see as the risks to public education as we reimagine education during and after COVID-19? We're going to start with uh, Fred Kowal from UUP. Okay, thanks very much, Emily, and thanks to everyone uh, who's joined uh, this call. And uh, um, I'm really honored uh, to be on the panel 
with my uh, my comrades, my colleagues uh, from um, uh, our you know our unions and uh, social justice organizations. To begin with, um, I think that uh, clearly. Uh, what COVID has done has laid bare the depths of the injustices that have existed in our nation going back centuries. Um, communities of color have been impacts, impacted so tremendously uh, by the pandemic, but really it's because of underfunding uh, of healthcare, of education, of all public services. And therefore, it is no surprise that where the pandemic is hitting worse is in these areas. And public higher education, specifically with SUNY, has been underfunded for over a decade, and we are seeing the consequences. Uh, first, I want to talk about the SUNY hospitals. Uh, there are three of them, one at Stony Brook, uh, one at uh, uh, Upstate in Syracuse, and one at the heart of the pandemic for so long in Brooklyn at Downstate. Because these hospitals were underfunded for years, uh, it was impossible for them to be prepared for the crisis when it hit. And yet amazingly enough, healing took place, lives were saved, even at the cost of our own members, uh, family members, community members who were there to take care of, of the patients. Remembering, of course, at the same time, these are educators. They're teaching the next generation of healthcare providers. And we even had members who are residents ready to step into the profession they were called upon to do patient care in ways that they never expected, and they had to put their lives on the line. And one of the ways that we saw the underfunding become crystal clear was because our members, the healthcare providers and the hospitals in the city and at Stony Brook out on Long Island, they didn't have the personal protective equipment necessary to stay healthy, to stay safe while they were taking care of patients. It got so bad that we had to work with our colleagues in other unions and we ourselves utilized our own resources to purchase personal protective equipment so that our, our members could go to work and not feel like they were gonna be facing a death sentence by going to work. We also worked as hard as we could to get places for our members to stay so they didn't have to go home. That's how dedicated they were both to their work and to their families. They didn't want to take the virus home. So they worked and then stayed at hotels uh, where we provided the rooms for them. That's an indicator, if there ever needs to be, about the level of underfunding that the hospitals that were called upon, and overwhelmingly these are public hospitals like Downstate, like Stony Brook, like Upstate, they were called upon without the public goods, without the public institutions. What would have been the situation? How bad would it have been? The reality is this is a clarion call that not only do we have to have single payer health care provided, publicly provided through a fair tax system, but then there has to be the, the resources poured into the education and training of health care providers and the facilities clinics in the poorest of neighborhoods in New York City and in rural upstate New York, where we have healthcare deserts as well. And that's what happens when you have a privatized, profit-driven healthcare system, just like public higher education has been under assault. And turning to that part of the work that we do as members of UUP, you know, we had to convert our education to online while also maintaining student services. Uh, that's half of our membership that does professional work uh, in things like uh, residential life, in admissions, in financial aid, in the Educational Opportunity Program, EOP. And of course, obviously, we're teaching classes. And all that went well enough in the emergency situation, but now we're preparing for the fall. But even right now, we've got members of our union who are, are being called back to work in office settings where they're not sure they're going to be safe because returning safely in the fall or now is going to take resources. It's not cheap to have physical distancing, to have masks, to have testing. All of those things take resources. And all I wanna ask is where was the private sector during this entire pandemic? They were looking to make profits and we see it in testing. If testing is done by private corporations, it is incredibly expensive. 
if public hospitals do it, if the public sector does it, it's affordable because there isn't the need for making profits. And so that's what we're up against. And so when, when we look at the situation in UUP, we see this as an opportunity. The, the crisis has shown what must happen. And higher education, indeed all of education, is the opportunity to help our society heal from the pandemic and from decades of underfunding of the public sector. And we have to turn things around and we have to do so aggressively. So I'm looking forward to the conversation we're gonna have this evening about how we turn this thing around. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, we'll turn it now to Donald Nesbitt from Local uh, 372. Or actually, we're gonna switch, we're gonna flip that. Are, are you? Okay, yes, Donald, you're up. <laughs> yeah, hey, uh, good evening, everyone. I want to say I'm excited to be on here. Thank you, Emily. Thank you to everyone who actually put this together. Um, I, I want to say that I'm happy to be a union member at a time like this. Um, I'm happy to be a part of a movement that when workers are out there in a pandemic like this, we're able to advocate for them um, and on their behalf. I... I got to say that during this time, there has been challenges. Um, there has been challenges for, give me one sec. Yeah, I want to I wanna say that at a time like this, um, you look at the worker from Amazon who stood up for himself for P things like PPE and he was fired, right? Within the state of New York, we don't have to go to um, uh, uh, um, a, a state that has worker oppression, right? We have it right here in the state of New York. Um, during this time for our workers, I represent a group of workers, 24,000 of them, 12,000 who are on the front line, the school um, crossing guards and the lunchroom workers. And like the brother mentioned right before me, we were at the beginning of this pandemic fighting for PPE. Uh, Friday so much into after a few days, our union made a decision to call a, an emergency executive board meeting and say, you know what, we have to, um, we have to buy masks for our workers. And we bought 20,000. The management came behind us and they bought 100,000 and they bragged to us that they had bought 100,000 more than we should, more than we did. And we said, you know what, you should have done that from the beginning. It is your responsibility, right, to keep the workers safe. I said, but if we want to break down numbers, there's 500 locations that's doing feed-in and 100,000, that's about 200. Um, and we're three weeks to a month into this, those 200 are gone. You need to order, like you order bleach, like you order hair nets, like you order everything else. There has to be a constant flow of these things coming in. The things that we saw that were exasperated during this time, um, the Department of Education in New York City, for whatever reason, decide that for some of the poorest people, uh, they were going to implement a policy at the beginning of this uh, where they send the email for them to change their check information. Most of the workers didn't even know that they had an email address that exists within the Department of Education. And so um, the conditions of not updating your information, you wouldn't get a check. So we had workers who have worked three, four pay periods, which is like a month and a half, two months, that didn't receive a paycheck. I've personally had to deliver pampers for families. I've personally had to deliver food for families. I've gone out of New York into New Jersey for a member who lived in New Jersey because when I learned from one of his managers that he was bringing his kids from New Jersey into a school in Brooklyn just to feed them, and then he ran out of money one week so he couldn't feed his kids that week, I said, I'll take money from my own home, but I can't see any one kid starving. And uh, these are just some of the things that we have been going through at this period of time. I had to reach out and use some political pressure as the PAC chair DC37, reach out to the city controller to let him know he needs to pressure the Department of Education to get people paid. Um, that pressure and also calling the Daily News 
and um, making a, a really big stink out of it, which it should be. Um, we got people paid um, within a few days, um, and it was about 700 families. But the dedication of workers are here, and I'm proud to be a part of this movement. One of the workers that I delivered Pampers to, she told me how she was hopping a train to get to work. Um, so the dedication from the workers is definitely there. They're feeding um, up to 500,000 meals a day right now, um, the lunchroom workers. And I'm just proud to be a part of this, but we also have the, the concerns with cuts now. And so if I may say before I forget, it's important for us to do our census to make sure that our com communities are counted um, at this time because we need adequate funding for schools and for everything else within our communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Donald. I'll turn it over now to Reverend Liz Theo Harris. Well, thanks so much for having me here. And this is an awesome panel of, of leaders and freedom fighters. So it's, it's awesome to be with everybody. Um, I was raised with a deep commitment to public education. And this pandemic has only taught me um, how much more we should be valuing public education. Uh, I have two elementary schools children. Um, I have taught in the past. I have a principal in the family. I have educators across my family. But um, the struggle of, of trying to figure out how to, how to educate my kids, um, how to hear about their, their classmates um, in the New York City public schools, I mean, it's, it's surely been a struggle. Um, not to mention what the, the teachers and administrators and everyone's going through. You know, indeed, uh, before this pandemic hit, there were 140 million people in the United States who were poor or low income. That was 43% of the U.S. population. 51% of kids were, being, were growing up in households that, doesn't, that don't have enough food. Um, and what we've, what we've seen throughout this pandemic is that these issues are only being exacerbated and only uh, you know, deepening and spreading and worsening. Um, in the United States, before this pandemic around COVID-19 hit, we had a pandemic of, of poverty. 250,000 people dying um, because of poverty every year, nearly 700 a day. Um, before this pandemic of public health hit, we had a pandemic of racism where we have levels of mass incarceration, where we have levels of racist voter suppression, where we have policies that have, um, have ensured uh, disproportionate impact of health inequality, of education inequality, of wages inequality um, to, to poor people and particularly to, to, to African Americans, to Latinos, to, to people of color. Um, and, and, and that again was before this pandemic hit. Uh, what we've heard since it's hurt, hit, if we're even just talking, you know, raw numbers, that 40% of families that were making $40,000 or less have lost a job. Um, that 45% increase in homelessness has already happened. Uh, that, you know, that a third of families were reporting that kids were going without food, let alone the, the numbers that um, are, are, are not are not reported. Um, and, you know, we already had tens of millions with inadequate health care. And, and what we've seen, um, as Emily said at the opening of this, is been trillions and trillions of dollars being poured in to bail out the rich, to bail out corporations, to bail out Wall Street, where you can have, you know, Wall Street having some of its best numbers in history at the same time that, that tens of millions of people are applying for unemployment and, and, and hundreds of millions of people in this country are just struggling to get by. And, and you know, when we talk about this question of reimagining anything, whether it's education, whether it's healthcare, whether it's living wages, I'm very excited about a, a conversation about reimagining. We cannot go back to normal. Normal was half of the US population suffering from poverty. Normal was police shooting African-American young people and old people you know, at, at un horrible rates. You know, normal was 
you know, a, a healthcare system where we spend more money um, and we have less healthcare. Normal was the, the schools that, the school that my kids go to has 70% of people um, living at or below poverty and therefore free breakfast, free lunch. And, and when the pandemic hit, you know, it took too long for many of our family members and friends to get food even, you know, in that pandemic. Normal was, you know, low wage work where we now call those workers essential, but their wages and their PPE is expendable, right? And um, so let's reimagine. But in that reimagining, we, we need to increase the funding. We need to increase the, the um, you know, the, the, the vision of, of, of how when we lift from the bottom, everybody rises. We have enough resources, you know, that 1.5 trillion bailout that was the first bailout that happened, that could have erased all of student debt across the country for a lifetime, right? That, that could have. But instead, you know, a couple of billionaires got, you know, billions more themselves. Um, so, so let's reimagine, but when we reimagine, let's make sure that we're lifting from the bottom. Let's make sure we're reimagining systems that have put forward poverty and racism um, and the militarization of our communities and schools um, and, and put those away and, and have something so beautiful and, and possible, you know, at, at hand. And so, so I'm, I'm looking forward to more conversation this evening um, and, and working alongside everybody here as we, we do indeed reimagine, but we reimagine for the public good, much of, of the history of, of the CUNY system, of the SUNY system, of the public school systems has been out of moments of crisis that we could come together and, and make life better for everybody. Um, and so let this be one of those moments. Amen, thank you so much, Reverend Liz. Um, we'll go now to Laura Franz in Albany. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for allowing me to participate on this panel. I've been really appreciated all the commentary so far. Um, exacerbated is the perfect word. So I represent the nearly 950 classroom teachers, guidance counselors, social workers, um, non-classroom professionals for the city school district of Albany. So the capital city public schools for the state of New York. Um, we are surrounded by several affluent districts. And what we have found is that what existed before has only been magnified through this pandemic crisis. So, you know, it's no secret that we move very swiftly to digital education. And the digital divide was very apparent in my district where we had to, you know, get Chromebooks into students' hands and uh, find hotspots and access free internet services for students so that families and children could get to those Google classrooms. Our L population, our uh, refugee population, do managing translation services, even the steps of getting those students and families logged on to a computer were Herculean tasks. They were nearly impossible. And our teachers worked really diligently to make sure that we could do that. Food insecurity, we have students who rely on a weekend backpack program where they bring food home so there's food for the, them and their family over the weekends. And now we've delivered over, over 300,000 meals to our students since shut down on March 13th. Um, and I think that is the most telling piece around this. We shut down our schools on Friday, March 13th, and we were teaching on that Monday. So we had Google Classrooms established. We had turned our practice a complete 180. Um, and re we had already reimagined how we were going to do this because that's what teachers do, right? Like we were gonna figure it out, how we were gonna connect and stay connected with our kids, how we were going to try to engage them, how we were going to try to make this work. Um, and we were going to do that in the usual way without resources. So our district um, is owed $38 million in foundation aid funding. Um, we currently are looking at uh, approximately 50 classroom teachers are being laid off. They will not be back next year. We are going to um, 
just absorb an additional 50 positions that are retirements. So there's close to 150 positions all told between classroom teachers, teaching assistants, hall monitors, people who work directly with children who won't be there next year to do this. Um, the other concern is we've tried to, you know, pull off teletherapy services and special education services for our students with disabilities. Um, and I'm a mom to two young men with autism and, you know, trying to manage everything that they've needed at home through this digital construct has been nearly impossible. And it's too easy to hear that that's another population that we could disenfranchise from the from public education. It's hard to educate young children with autism or with students with disabilities over a computer monitor. So can we just change it so we don't have to is my concern. That's an inherent risk, I would say, in this construct. Um, so, you know, I think some of the risks going forward is, you know, like most things, if you do a good job at something, what's typically your reward? We're going to give you more of that thing to do, right? So, you know, we did a good job, I think, turning, turnkeying and changing our professional practice in a moment. When you look at this, like, period of history that we're living through, we changed how we did instruction in a moment. And what can happen from that is reimagining now says, okay, well, they showed us they could do that. So that is the way we should do that. And when we look at who is on those reimagining committees, as you've already pointed out, um, it's not a lot of classroom teachers. It's not a lot of professional practitioners who know pedagogically what is sound, what is working for children, what is good for instruction. And that's really the voices who should be leading that work. Because as that mom of, student disability, of students with disabilities, what is best about this is they are entitled to a free, appropriate public education. And that has to be what is at the forefront of our work for all of our students. And that won't be what is at the forefront of the billionaires and the people that they've put on these committees to reimagine what my profession should look like. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Laura. Um, now we'll hear from Andrea Vasquez with PSC CUNY. Okay, thank you. Good evening. Thanks to the Labor Religion Coalition for pulling this together. It's great to be here with others in the labor movement to speak about this pivotal historical moment. I'll say a few words about the City University of New York um, before and after COVID and look forward to later, uh, speaking later with what we've done inside our 30,000 member union, the Professional Staff Congress, as well as actions we've taken with other unions and allies. And I, of course, look forward to speaking about reimagining education as well. As many of you know, CUNY serves 260,000 degree granted, degree seeking students. They are 76% people of color. They speak hundreds of different languages and 50% of our students are from families with incomes under $30,000 a year. Over 65% of New York City's public high school graduates attend CUNY. Over the past 10 years, CUNY's state funding has decreased by 18% adjusted for inflation. The institution has been starved for funds. These decades of drastic intentional underfunding represent an unequal and racist disinvestment and a disregard for our students' futures. 73% of, of, of CUNY funding comes from New York State, and their disinvestment has said to our students that black lives do not matter, that brown lives do not matter, and that poor students do not matter. Like our sisters and brothers at SUNY, our union's been fighting these budget shortfalls for decades, but here we are. At CUNY, we now have 4,000 fewer full-time faculty than we had in the 1970s, with 30,000 more students. With COVID and a governor who has gained more and more control over the state budget while refusing to raise taxes on the wealthy, the path to a better CUNY seems frightfully longer and steeper. Since COVID-19 crisis began, our members, our students, our surrounding CUNY communities, and our quality of education have all suffered severe blows in several ways. 
The public health crisis hit, hit hardest on the lives and futures of CUNY's black and brown students and their families. The funding crisis is being used as a means to bolster the harmful funding structures that support austerity education. The escalation of police violence has highlighted the obstacles our students confront on a daily basis. And those who wish to further corporatize public education are licking their chops at the opportunity to further cheapen students' education by increasing their reliance on fully online courses while increasing class size. And it's clear that this harms those with the fewest resources and the fewest academic skills. Sadly, on top of all that, CUNY made a mark for itself because, because of the speed with which they alone announced a hiring freeze, layoffs of adjunct faculty and other part-timers, and cuts to programs, even before go the governor announced a single budget cut, even before funds designated in the CARES Act to save jobs were received. So it's been a fight every step of the way to get our administration to do the right thing, from allowing people to work remotely to announcing layoffs and programmatic cuts, to asking union members to rescind appointments of other union members, to threatening to increase class size. But members within the rank and file and at every level of leadership are listening to each other and to our students and to those who have taken to the streets. We support them, we join them, we're hearing them, and we're fighting with and for them. But we need to ask ourselves, what can we do? What, what must we do? And what must we do differently to meet the needs of this moment, to build the power we need to see a seismic shift in how our institutions are funded and function to serve the public? I believe we'll only succeed if we broaden our coalitions and join with others in labor, with our students, with our communities and organizational allies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. Uh, and now we'll hear from uh, our Final speaker, Andrew Dobbin with GSEU at Stony Brook. All right, hi. Uh, thanks everybody for uh, coming. And uh, yeah, so we're kind of a strange uh, bargaining unit and a strange group of workers in, in New York State. Uh, we're, we're often kind of considered invisible or forgotten about because uh, we occupy a very strange place. We're a hybrid, right? We're both students and we're employees. And our employment status is based uh, and conditional on our student status. And so COVID has been a, an interesting couple months, I can tell you that. And it's definitely accelerated a lot of the uh, not so great things about the SUNY system that we've been uh, dealing with and intensified them. Obviously, you can imagine that when a pandemic hits and suddenly uh, a faculty that is usually not great at the internet is expected to suddenly be great at the internet, that the uh, younger graduate assistants are going to be leaned on heavily to teach them how, you know, Zoom works, how this works, how that works. Uh, so we initially had a huge amount of uh, dealing with overwork in that regard. Uh, our own members who were instructors of record teaching their own classes had to, you know, at the drop of a hat, change everything. We had to uh, deal with the fact that because of uh, the way SUNY is now structured, graduate students are usually the instructors who have the most face-to-face -face time with uh, undergraduate students. And because of cuts in uh, mental health and counseling all throughout the SUNY system, we often become default mental health counselors, which we're not even trained for, right? So we had this uh, fun grab bag combination of, one, sort of assisting our departments and helping them kind of figure out how this all works. Two, you know, making sure our own lives were kind of in order. And three, uh, helping out our students and making sure that they didn't have, uh, you know, serious problems themselves, right? And it also had consequences in the fact that uh, we had legislation that would have been groundbreaking and life-changing for a lot of our members. That was this close to passing. We were this close to getting it into the budget. And then COVID happened and poof. Um, we, unlike any other group of workers in this state, have to pay as a condition of our employment about 10% of our income back up front to the university in the form of fees. And these fees have doubled over the past uh, eight years alone. And this legislation would have abolished them which would have meant 
enormous relief to our membership because we have people selling plasma, we have people eating food out of the garbage, uh, we have people engaging in sex work in order to make ends meet because they are so desperate to do the research that they want to do, but they're just not being paid enough. And that was ready to be passed and then boom, Covo nu Cuomo nukes it with co COVID. So um, it's, it's been an issue. However, I, I am very hopeful because I think we are entering a period where we have leverage. And if we're willing to use that leverage, I think we can get a lot done. Um, this is especially the case for folks like myself where we're graduate teaching assistants and um, with the increased amount of uh, class size, uh, class sections, because we're reducing class sizes, because we're socially distancing classes, there's going to be a lot more teaching that needs to be done. And usually we're the ones who are going to do it. So we're excited to um, organize and prepare for the fall and prepare for, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, the class war that needs to happen, both within the classroom and within the working class as a whole. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Andrew. And thank you to all of you for putting out kind of the, the context of what we have been dealing with, what you have been dealing with, what students have been dealing with. And it's very striking to hear both how this came after there had already been so much disinvestment. You're starting, so to speak, not with a full deck. And yet, where would we be if it weren't for education workers who have been feeding kids and families and you know per, you know filling in all these gaps um it's it's really astounding to see kind of that juxtaposition of, of what we're facing um so for folks on zoom and on facebook we're going to um, start taking questions from all of you so as a reminder if you're on facebook you can put a question in the comments if you're on Zoom, there's a Q&A icon in the bottom that you can use to submit a question. Um, but I'll pull out, pull, uh, put out a, a, a first question to pose to all of you, um, really to, to get into a little more about what does the fight look like now? You've all spoken to a little bit, but what, um, what, is, what is coming up and how are, how are you and your uh, comrades preparing preparing to take on these challenges. And any of you can go first. Laura. Okay. Um, so the fight is to still put the value where we should be, which is in our public schools and public education. And to can you continue to do that, it is to make sure that we are making pedagogically sound decisions for students that is not behind a computer screen and, you know, this kind of mass education. We're just going to disenfranchise more children who don't have that access and equity already. Um, and what I think is on our side in this is, you know, we've all seen the memes about like, you know, or the videos like, teacher, what do you want? We'll give you whatever you want. Like, just take them back kind of thing. Um, and, you know, that's, they're funny and they're cute, but I think there is a, 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 a recognition in this moment from parents and families about that this work is hard and, you know, that that they are, there's an appreciation for what um, teachers have done for their children and, and the value that teachers have in our society. Um, and so I think that becomes the catalyst that we need to use to help propel us towards that equity that we need in our public education systems. Um, because we're capable of doing the work. You have to allow us the, the, the right conditions yeah. to do that. And we need to stop this defunding or underfunding of public schools. Um, so I, I think that would be sort of my response in this moment around that. Yeah, a friend. Okay, yeah. Um, First, I would say 
uh, we are at a, an incredibly um, a great opportunity. Uh, we've got tens of thousands of people uh, in the streets uh, demanding justice. And this is, this is beautiful because the energy, the power, and the overwhelming nonviolent nature of it um, is bringing about change faster than I would have expected. Um, with the state legislature passing uh, police reform bills like that over the last three days. Um, and uh, we supported that, we, we welcome it. But drawing on that energy, now what needs to happen, and that's why things like the Poor People's uh, Campaign and event coming up, and all the other events that are rolling forward, um, involving labor, involving social justice groups, it's continuing the pressure. And where the pressure needs to go now, now that we are moving both at the state and federal level on police reform, is to get at the, the socioeconomic justice issues, which if you look at the coronavirus, you look at climate change, those are two symptoms of one major issue, which is environmental and economic injustice. How do we address those things? And we have to see the reality of an economic collapse and a pandemic and now a social justice crisis as all interrelated. And as a couple of people on the panel have already said, we're not going back. I mean, for starters, that's a retreat. There is no back to go back to that in any way, shape, manner, or form reflects a just country or a just society. And so in this crisis, much like in the Great Depression, there was the opportunity and some pushed hard for change and we did get some progressive legislation. That's the opportunity we now have. We must pass tax reform in New York State so billionaires and millionaires pay. Since the pandemic started, Millionaires and billionaires have made tons of money. It is unconscionable that in this crisis, they're getting wealthier. Tax them, turn the money to where it's needed in education, in social services, in healthcare. And it has, this is the opportunity. This is the moment. And so we're organizing around those issues and pressing both federally, but also at the statewide level. There's an urgency, but we ought to be ready for a very long fight on a whole host of issues to build a society out of this chaos and, and disaster of the, the pandemic. Because otherwise, we're gonna be quote unquote back to where we were, but then facing more crisis as they develop. Great. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, I would say, um, it's important to, to think about the power we all have here on this panel, right? We each uh, represent unions with thousands upon thousands of members. And if we do a good job and we mobilize our members and we organize them and we, you know, force power to actually accept our demands, we can get a lot done. Um, and it's not like these situations are insolvable, right? I mean, just off the top of my head, we can divest from police and prisons and reinvest in jobs and education. We can uh, use something like public banking in order to essentially create money to fund public needs. Uh, we can tax, like Fred was saying, millionaires and billionaires, right? There's tons of them and they love living in their fancy houses in New York City. Let's tax them. So it's just a matter of getting the political will. And as we saw with, you know, the George Floyd protests and 50A getting repealed like that. It's a question of, do you have the people in the street? Do you have the people in the shop floor in the workplace? And are you willing to push and push hard? Because, you know, sometimes there's consequences to that. Sometimes, you know, power attacks back, but we don't have a choice. Absolutely. Andrea. Hi, thanks. Yeah, I mean, um, to pick up on what Fred and others are saying, I think um, there is, we do have to have our eyes on what the, what a solution is. This, the, uh, we need funding. I mean, we need to shift priorities entirely um, and for the public good, as people have mentioned. Um, you know, 
I think there's a lot of public will. There's a lot of a, a will, a political will right now. Um, but it's still a lot of work to do that. And I guess it has been incredibly inspiring to see so many people in the street. Um, I know that our members, you know, have never been as active as they are right now. And we've had, you know, I don't know if you've followed the press around here, but CUNY, we've had so many articles and the union hasn't or done most of those articles. We haven't even nudged people to do it. We've had faculty member after faculty member submit op-eds in, in the Daily News and in, in local papers that are the most eloquent statements and arguments about why we have to support public institutions. So that kind of thing with so many people just stepping up on their own. I mean, those are, that's the academic way of stepping up. We've also done caravans. We're going to do something on June 23rd, another action, making the CUNY Cuomo connection. Um, but that hasn't been totally announced yet. Um, we do, we want to do something with students. We want to get thousands of us in the streets safely because there is something in that physical presence. And that's what's so hard. Part of what's so hard about this pandemic is you know, our usual way of organizing, being face to face, being in a room with people, you know, feeling their presence is really hard on Zoom. And so much of this, uh, I, obviously the last few months have been so much on Zoom. People are coming out, but we have to be really careful about that. We don't want to contribute to, a, a, you know, a return of the, of the, of the, of the of rise of the virus. So, but it is, um, I think it's really important for us to be out there. I think we're going to be functioning very differently for a long time. So um, those masks and those ways of being together without being right on top of each other, I think we have to come up with some creative ways to organize and, um, and have even one-on-one -on -one conversations. As union folks, we're used to walking into someone's office and wanting to talk about things and you know, going out to lunch or a drink or something, you know, and we can't do any of that now. So um, I think there is the political will. I think we see it every night, right? I mean, we used to just hear clapping at seven o'clock and now, you know, you go out and you go to the supermarket. I'm in Manhattan and, you know, lo and behold, a demonstration goes by. I don't know where they came from. I don't know how it happened, but it's exciting. And I think we have to be a part of that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you all. Um, so we have a couple of questions that have come in here. Um, one on Facebook from Paul Webster. How do we work to develop talking points for educators on the new normal? I'll take a crack at that. Um, thanks, Paul, for the question. Um, we, when we um, we released a, a statement yesterday on on um, uh, the passage of uh, what had been done thus far, and um, and then pivoted from that uh, to a discussion about the need for uh, massive investment in healthcare education and healthcare provision um, in the in the green revolution. Uh, to transition our economy and uh, our entire society. Um, and in essence, the, and, and this is where we have to, in, in our particular union, we've got campuses all across New York State. There's a huge difference between the political culture at a campus like the University at Albany or at Stony Brook um, or at the medical school at Downstate than there is at the technical campus where I used to teach here at Cobleskill, a very rural conservative community, um, very much Trump country. Um, and so that's the difference that we have to face. And in terms of the, the talking points with the new normal, the way that, that I see uh, the necessity is to communicate first the, the crisis that we face but the unique position we have in public higher education. Um, in order to get past the crises, we have to be able first and foremost to listen to each other. Um, and, you know, and those are skills that we have to have as educators. We listen to our students. We have to listen to community members, especially those who are coming from underrepresented communities because they have not been listened to. And it is not time for people like me to be speaking about race issues. It's for people like me 
to listen. Um, second is for all of us to understand that throughout our careers as educators, whether we're, we're from the left or on the right in the political spectrum, we have changed lives. That's a public institution having a direct impact on the lives of individuals and on a society. That's what we can do. And whether, and we have members, I'm sure, who don't like the demonstrations that are going on. It's a very small minority. But the message that we have in our talking points is, look at what is being achieved. How quickly it is, that's the power. And it's a matter of us using that, you know, as Andrew was saying, we just have to take the, the power that we have and use it. Um, and whether it's voting, whether it's in a census, or getting out into unique settings where we can deliver a message to our, our political leaders. Um, I, I think Andrea said it best, this is, this is gonna be difficult. We can't do what we've always done, not the same way. And yet, the, the opportunity for change is there. Um, we, we just have to be able to listen and then act. Kind of building on that point, we have a question from Joe um, about action, direct action. Um, in the past few years, we've seen a wave of work actions and organizing around the country in the public education field, both in places that were highly organized like Chicago and LA, and in places that were much less organized like or Arizona and Oklahoma. What are some lessons you've identified from those struggles that are shaping the way your union responds to this crisis? So I, I really want to kind of uh, build off of the point that Fred, I think, was really making about um, to talk first, You, we, we have to listen. And I think that Li truly listening to our membership, um, really making sure that we are not, uh, that we are building that sort of, um, we're coalescing that solidarity uh, among all of us to make sure we're representing what is right and fair and just. Um, I think why we saw so many of those teacher organizing actions work was because they were advocating for students and what students needed. They needed, you know, classroom spaces that weren't, you know, disheveled and molding and rotting and falling down around them. They needed s supplies. Um, they needed, uh, you know, what is good for students. Um, and ultimately, you know, that's what I think teachers are looking to do. And so you have to hear what your community needs. You have to hear what your members need and then from that listening, you go out and do the talking. And I think that is really where you um, sort of build that strength so that you are representative of the needs and of what your members need you to say. Yeah, Andrea. Now I am hearing the whistles and the hammers and the yelling. <laughs> and the um, but I think in answer to the question, which is a, an important question that was asked, um, I think we do have, uh, and it isn't easy for us in New York State because we know the restrictions that we're under to take job actions because of the Taylor Law. But I certainly think that one of the lessons we've learned from this moment is that there is a need to take action. I think that's what we're all saying. And I think there's a need for us to um, think and, and get ready to do things differently. And, um, you know, I mean, that is taking a job action is the most powerful thing a union can do. Um, we know that. And it's a huge, uh, it's a huge step to take for so many workers, especially at a time when it's, you know, people are so glad they're in a union and they're so glad they have a job. So risking that job, obviously, for people is huge. But, um, I think, you know, as Laura said, we are interested in our students. We are interested in the bigger issues of education for our communities. So maybe this is a time that people will see that it is, there is a need to escalate and to take different kinds of actions. Andrew, I saw your hand up too, I think. 
Yeah, just to quickly say, you know, we, we're 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 stuck with the Taylor Law, but the Taylor Law came about because it was illegal to have a public sector strike and illegal to have public sector unions, and public sector workers said, eh, "Too bad," um, and the labor law caught up with them because labor law is an expression of labor power, and it will follow where uh, the where the power of uh, workers is, right? So when labor is weak, labor law is weak. When labor is strong, labor law is strong. So I think the question is less, you know, like, how do we get around this terrible law? We got to change it, you know, like we hear this every year from AFL-CIO. It's like, oh, the numbers are down. We need the PRO Act. We need the Employee Free Choice Act. We need this act. And it's like, the law ain't going to help you. You got to organize and you got to build power and then you got to use it. And then the law will change. And then you'll get better. Yeah, Fred. Yeah, quickly, I think um, what we saw, what I saw in West Virginia, uh, also where there was success, um, was uh, community support. And that's something that uh, I know that um, unions on this panel have done a really good job at building community coalitions. Uh, and that's something that we are emphasizing now. Except I, I, I prefer the term allies uh, because sometimes the, the nature of coalitions, and this is a problem in the labor movement sometimes, where you know you form a coalition and it's you know you got to be united on every issue. We know, for instance, that a number of us in the labor movement have real problems with the, the PBA unions, which have stood in the way of any kind of police reforms and and more more uh, uh, steps even more dangerous uh, to African American communities. But allies across the progressive system where we can work together in communities and build support so that if we have to take labor action, we've got communities and some of these conservative communities behind us as well. And I think that becomes more important because then your power redoubles uh, throughout the political system. Absolutely. Um, thanks, Fred. Um, we have another question from Wendy Sampson. Can we get a sustained push to change the funding formula for schools in New York? While these efforts have failed in the past, the governor has certainly noticed that this could be the time to seize the moment to get better equity for K-12 public districts here in New York. Any thoughts on that, that one, particularly about um, K through 12? Hi. Yeah. Sure. Well, it's not a K to 12 panel, um, but I think we definitely support, you know, a full funding and, and much, much improved funding for K to 12. I mean, as I pointed out, even, you know, at CUNY, we, those are our students in a couple of years, right? Those are the students who can go to SUNY. They're not going to the privates. And so we, you know, the, the better prepared and the better equipped young people are, you know, the better they will be in college. And, you know, we think all of it, I was actually on a, a New York City Council discussion this morning, a forum that they did on higher ed. And, um, and it, was, it was terrific to see the, um, the, the power, the, the, the will, to sort of change the funding and to, to have CUNY really serve the whole city. And serving the whole city, I mean, how many, you know, public school, elementary school kids are, you know, just a huge number. It really has to do with the whole future of this city. So I think we're all in it with that struggle. I know Robert Jackson has been pushing that, Senator Jackson, you know, for a long time. I haven't been up on what the actual latest, you know, news is on that, but hopefully, you know, we really would like, that was what I was going to say about the city council was the idea, um, uh, uh, Chairperson Barron, Inez Barron, said she really sees the goal of having free education being from K to 16. That, that, and that's the kind of aspirational goal that I think we agree, right? We hear, you know, suddenly free college was like a crazy idea a few years ago. Well, now it's not such a crazy idea. People are talking about it. So the idea that we are entitled to a decent education, our children, not just K to 12, but K to 16, should be a real expectation that we have and should be something that we fight for. And that, and that has to do with the raising of taxes and redistribution of wealth. 
Yeah, Laura. So I think as one of, uh, as the K-12 representative on the panel, um, I might argue that I'm not entirely sure that that equity has been so visible um, around having to re look at how we redistribute the funding formula. Um, we have pushed time and time again, as you pointed out, Wendy, um, I think there we there have been small changes that have been made. Um, you know, districts have almost gotten to the point. I know we have engaged in lobbying efforts. Can we pull out community schools money so that's not in our foundation aid formula? Can we change how we're funding pre-K uh, formulas? Because if you've jumped on board with pre-K um, pre this certain year, you're getting paid at this rate. But now afterwards, like we are so in the minutia to try to scrape back any little bit we can out of that formula that it's almost like we've lost the larger vision which is that this formula doesn't it's nowhere near getting to where we need to provide that equitable distribution across all our schools so a thousand percent agree with you that we this is a time that is ripe to really try to continue to push this issue and how we fully fund our schools um but i'm not sure that vision is as clear from our our leadership and some how we message that how we make sure that people are picking up that banner i think is is our work then Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you spoke to this a little bit, Laura, and I think probably many people watching are familiar with um, the Campaign for Fiscal Equity and the chronic underfunding and, and the lawsuit about that. Um, but do you want to say just a couple words about, um, you know, when you said Albany was owed $38 million already, just a little bit of background on that. Yeah, so I mean, I think it's, you know, when when the fiscal crisis of the early 2000s, they drew back from the foundation aid formula to, you know, uh, rechannel funny money into other places. The tax cap has had a tremendous impact on what we've been able to do. So you look at a lot of districts who go out with 0% levies and, you know, because their communities are, are trying to stay under that 2%. Um, there's other states that have done that in a different way um, and, and in a more sense-making way. Um, so there's got to be some balance there, I would say. Um, it's, you know, we just participated in a campaign. Where we have a school that's a mile from the state capitol that's a community school. We, have, we run a food pantry. We run laundry for students. My kid's about to say hi, sorry. Um, wave hi, buddy. You're live with lots of people. Um, so, you know, I think that, you know, that's part of the struggle right now is like, how are we making those connections to the neighborhoods that, you know, in Albany in particular, we have so many properties that aren't subject to because they're federal or state buildings. So they don't even go into our formula, um, you know, so, I, I don't, I'm not sure I answered your question there, Emily, but I think those are all the components that, you know, there's these little tendrils that if you pull on them, the whole thing unravels and we still end up with nothing, um, you know, or not enough. And what the bigger issue will be is, you know, pull out this thread from this pandemic and this crisis we're in right now. Five years from now, our schools will be back on a list for being underperforming, not having high enough graduation rates, we'll be in receivership. It'll all be laid at the feet of the teachers and, and the people who are running the schools, as opposed to the people who didn't fund us adequately to do right by children. And that's what's really going to be the thing that should you know, that angers me every year, that you lay that at our feet, but you chronically underfund us. Um, Donald, were you getting getting ready to say something? Yeah, I was. I'm I'm listening to um, we we as unions we we have a voice, right? Um, and we we can continue to hammer the message home uh, to the governor and to our elected officials that schools should be a priority. 
the same way that you put money into prisons um, and, and you put money into a whole lot of um, things. And even we look at lottery tax and a whole lot of things in the state of New York that's supposed to be, that's supposed to go into schools that doesn't go into schools. Um, and schools, schools are always a part of the discussion we, when we talk about cuts, um, cuts to children. That just never should happen, right? Um, we have to make sure that we continue to elect elected officials who understand that. Um, one of the things that we, that we have started to do in my union is some of the members who actually work in schools or who work in these agencies and institutions, we're training them to be elected officials, to be candidates. We started a candidate school uh, for them because it's much easier to go into the legislative halls and speak to someone who actually un understands, right, that funding for schools should not be cut. Um, so we, we started a candidate school um, in that aspect. Uh, we, we have to continue to hammer home to the governor um, who some people are thinking at this time is doing a great um, job around COVID-19, right? But I continue to remind people of all of the inconsistencies prior to COVID-19, right? Um, on this governor's be behalf and some of the things that Como has done, like Laura mentioned, $38 uh, billion to schools in the state of New York, which he refuses to give to us. And each year he says, oh, I give you one billion, right? Um, that does nothing statewide for us. When you divide that throughout the school districts in the state of New York, it does nothing to solve some of the, the, the real inconsist inconsistencies and problems um, that exist not only in New York City, but we look across um, the school systems and even in CUNY and different things of that nature. One thing we could also do, my national union, um, and I don't know if some of the other unions do it, but I'll just say it. So it's an idea. The national union a few years ago asked me decided to do free college for its members and their children. Um, and it started out with an, a two-year college and now is expanded to a four-year program. Um, I don't know if they're going into a master's program soon, but there's stepping stones. So they went to as an associate and now it's moved on to a bachelor's degree. But those are some of the ways that we can uh, work internally to make sure that education is a priority. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Donald. So I know several of us have um, some immediate and kind of specific ways that our organizations and this larger movement are taking action um, that we can share. So before we move into that, though, I just want to see if there are any um, last questions that folks want to get in uh, to the chats or any um, comments from our panelists that you haven't gotten to share so far. All right, well, we'll move into some of these actions and we'll keep an eye out for, um, for other questions that are coming up. Um, so we've heard a couple mentions so far of the Poor People Campaign, a national call for moral revival. And we had Ren Leslie Harris with us um, who had to get off um, to, to be part of something else, but who's a national co-chair of that campaign. Um, Labor Religion Coalition of New York State has been very active in uh, coordinating that campaign here in New York State. Um, and I think Fred mentioned it already, but we are getting ready for a really big gathering um, a week from Saturday on June 20th. Several months ago, we had planned for this to be a massive rally in Washington, D.C. Obviously, those plans have had to change. And so this will be a really massive digital justice gathering that will still um, be a mass assembly of directly impacted folks all around the country. Um, and you will get the, the link to that in the chat. But this is a, a movement that has, is the relaunching of the Poor People's Campaign that Reverend Martin Luther King was working at at the time of his death. It relaunched on the 50th anniversary of that original campaign a couple years ago and is working to bring together uh, different movements 
around the issues of systemic racism, poverty, ecological devastation, and militarism. And uh, this gathering on June 20th will be an opportunity to really highlight the impact that we are seeing um, of the pandemic, as well as this, you know, renewed awareness of racist violence and state violence against particularly Black people in our country. Um, and to hear both how people are being hurt in this moment, but more importantly, how people are coming together and organizing and taking care of each other um, and putting out a vision of, of the kind of world that we believe in that um, addresses all the needs of people around education and housing and healthcare and safety and environmental justice and all of these things. So, um, and labor unions are a big part, an important part of this movement. Um, and we've been really blessed to have partnership from, from unions across the state and country. So please do check that out. Um, and I wanna invite actually our panelists to, to just say a few words about things that, that you shared. Um, Andrew, do you wanna say a couple things about the, um, the petitions that GSEU is putting out? Yeah, um, we have a, a petition with uh, COVID-19 demands. Um, it's the typical kind of stuff that all the unions have been asking. Uh, specifically for us, uh, we're trying to get SUNY to commit to providing uh, additional bridge funding over the summer because a lot of people are losing additional sources of money and also for SUNY to commit when fall starts and things properly reopen, adequate PPE, because right now the reopening plans have two cloth mask coverings, very exciting, not adequate, as well as um, uh, making sure that there are no uh, mass firings or hiring freezes uh, for graduate assistants or teaching assistants. And then um, in addition, as part of CWA, we're supporting something called the New York Heroes, uh, currently prospective executive order, but it's being turned into an act as well. Uh, we're gonna be pushing for that. And it co covers most of the things that we've been talking about, uh, PPE, hazard pay for first responders, these sorts of things. Um, but yeah, I think a, a lot of stuff uh, in terms of what folks can do is is going to be dependent on how the reopening looks and, and, and what happens therein. So uh, be on the lookout from us because uh, I think we're going to be bringing a ruckus. That is great to hear. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, Fred, do you want to share a little bit about the Workers First Caravan for Racial and Economic Justice? Yeah, um, <clears throat> and this is uh, uh, something that was talked about for a while. Um, and uh, I know that our, our national affiliate, uh, the uh, AFT, um, American Federation of Teachers, was pushing hard on, on the uh, AFL-CIO. And also, uh, the ASME union to do something major, a caravan in Washington, D.C., to support the passage of the HEROES Act um, to ensure that states get assistance uh, and we get um, the proper kind of funding for hospitals, for frontline workers, for uh, those who are going to be suffering uh, PTSD from their work in the COVID environment and for education. Uh, because of all the transition that's happened and all the, the budgetary burdens that are being faced that we've talked about. Um, and so there will be a caravan. Uh, it's across the country. There are numerous locations. Um, the first one will be in New York State as of now. will be in Albany this Saturday. Um, and then there will be one in Buffalo on Wednesday and then in Kingston on Saturday. Um, and the Hudson Valley uh, Local uh, Labor uh, Council is organizing that and working that with our members at the uh, New Paltz uh, College chapter. Uh, we are also continuing to work on our letter writing and petitioning with the federal government. We had over 3,000 letters and phone calls additional to that to uh, Congress and senators, and we're stepping that up again with AFT because we need Mitch McConnell and Trump to do something for those who are suffering as much as it goes against their instincts. Um, and then also joining with everyone who's on this panel, all of our unions and other groups, 
uh, pushing the legislature to stay in Albany to pass a legitimate tax reform to fund the programs that need to be funded. So all of that, uh, and there will be more as we build our, our alliances in our communities. Uh, there will be more actions. When we talk about, as Andrew was saying, we're talking about coming back, you know, we are not going to tolerate a situation where our members' lives and our students' lives are endangered. Um, and whatever risks may be involved, actions will have to take place because it'll be life and death. And so again, um, we're ready, and I know everybody uh, uh, that's engaged in our work is ready for what's needed. Yeah, and it was, it was great to see the UUP did a, a good, long, comprehensive document about what safety would look like, what a good return would look like. So that was, uh, that was really important. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, at, at the City University of New York, we've already faced massive layoffs and the threats of it. So we are, um, we're actually going to have an action on the 23rd, I mentioned. So uh, I think I gave a link to you to share if people, if people are in the city and you want to go out socially distant or, and it will be a digital component as well. But, um, you know, as we said, there's, uh, we, uh, waiting for this federal money. Um, it should come. We hope it comes, but we really um, have to keep pressing. We can't just keep our fingers crossed and, um, you know, and just wait and then not do anything. So I think we're going to have to be really on top of it all summer. Absolutely. And on that note, um, and speaking to what Fred also already mentioned, um, we have a link from NYSA to you, particularly around this, um, this question of funding. Um, do you want to add anything about that, Laura? Uh, just, yes, I totally agree. We have to push for that federal funding, but I think we also have to look where we can generate revenue within our own state and look at the billionaire's tax, the millionaire's tax, pay the tear taxes, um, and really, uh, continue to push to, you know, we were underfunded before this crisis. And we shouldn't forget that as we sort of look to the federal government now to, you know, tr get funding from them. Um, so continuing to push right here at home with that Fund Our Future campaign that NYSED is running um, to continue to get money back for schools. Um, and that's going to be really critical. So thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, and that's a reminder too that again all these issues are connected when we look at education and things like housing and health care um, and knowing that several of the unions on this call also represent health care workers and people in the healthcare care industry um, and the cuts that we've seen even before the pandemic really took off in New York State to Medicaid that are going to impact frontline hospitals um, as well as home care that there's a lot, a lot at the state level that we really have to keep our eyes on and, and push on. Well, we are coming to the end of our time together. Um, and I just wanna thank again, our panelists so much for joining us and also for the work that you are doing to fight uh, not only for your members, but for our communities across the state um, at this time when we really need you. Um, and thank you to everybody who tuned in. Thanks for the, the great questions. Please keep your eyes out for an email with the recording of this, which the, with the links to all the information and action items. Take those actions now. And most importantly, keep your eyes and ears and hearts open to the long fight ahead of us that we are really going to need to collaborate with each other and practice solidarity um, and reimagine what New York could look like not in the eyes of the billionaire class, but in the eyes of those of us who are caring first and foremost about um, the people of this state who have been most directly and horribly impacted by this crisis. Um, so thank you again so much um, and have a, have a wonderful evening and be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, have a good one everybody. Bye, everybody.